Welcome, welcome everyone. We're so glad you're here. Welcome to TechSoup's Leveraging Public Data for Social Impact. We're gonna give folks about one more minute to join and then we'll get started. We are so happy that you're here. My name is Elizabeth Hunt and I'm a Senior Director at TechSoup. As people are joining, please go ahead and put your name and where you're joining from into the chat. Thanks. Great. Okay, we've got a great group. Thank you for joining us today from wherever you are. We know you're bringing together, we are bringing together a fantastic group of people with a diverse set of knowledge and backgrounds. And we really want you to participate in the conversation and share your thoughts and feedback. So I'd like to share a little bit of the how-to. You can go ahead and advance to the next slide. Thank you. Okay, so first of all, please use the chat function to participate in this, the discussion. You can see in your toolbar that there is a chat there. And again, please enter your name and where you're joining from so that we can uh, get a sense of who's here and build the engagement. <clears throat> I'm just going to say I'm in Northern California, just north of the Golden Gate Bridge. We really encourage questions. That there's a particular way to do that. So please use the button marked Q&A also in the toolbar. Number three, we do have closed captioning available and you can click show captions to see a full live transcript as we move through the session. That's also in the toolbar down below. And fourth point, we are recording today. We will share the recording and slides with you by email following the session. And just to note that this is the second in a series Yesterday's session, uh, Democratizing Access to Data, will also be available for you. So I have the privilege of introducing TechSoup, a nonprofit organization that for more than 35 years has sought to be an ally to anyone in the world doing good. TechSoup is the leader and founder of the TechSoup Global Network. Our mission is to build a dynamic bridge that leverages technology to enable connections and innovative solutions for a more equitable planet. So what do we do? Together, we move mission critical resources and solutions to local organizations wherever they are so that they can achieve their goals. We share solutions, skills, insights, and strategies that help civil society improve its resilience and respond to the challenges for the future. We seek to drive impact at the organization, community, and civil society sector so our work with Google's Data Commons is a natural evolution of our longtime focus on data as a public resource and on building digital public infrastructure. I'm going to share with you a little bit about the power and reach of the TechSoup Global Network, but I really encourage you to explore each one of the local TechSoup Global Network partners and learn about their local impact. So the TechSoup Global Network consists of more than 50 separate nonprofit organizations who share values to try to really help organizations succeed. We reach 234 countries and territories. It, the network is super unique. It brings the benefits of local on the ground relationships, insights, trust, and feedback with a global unified mission and operation of, operational ability to deliver positive impact at worldwide scale. Since our founding, the TechSoup Global Network has served more than 1.4 million nonprofit organizations worldwide. We've collectively delivered more than 21 billion US dollars worth of in-kind technology and funding, thanks to generous corporate and foundation donors. The TechSoup Global Network operates in 39 languages and is understandable to 5.2 billion people worldwide. A simple Google search suggests that's nearly two thirds of the world's population. Now it is my great pleasure to introduce TechSoup's Chief Community Impact Officer, Marnie Webb, to share more about how Google's Data Commons can help you and the organizations and communities you serve.
you'd think by now I'd know to unmute myself before I start talking, but no, still a lesson I'm learning every single time. Hi, I'm Marnie Webb. I'm coming at you from my family living room, family room in Berkeley, California. And it's wonderful to see all of you here. I see Canada and Texas and upstate New York and Illinois, uh, Michigan, Louisiana. It's terrific. It, it's terrific to have all of you here. Let me share a little bit about what we're going to be talking about today. Um, first, we're going to do welcome and introductions with the panelists that gener generously agreed to be on here and talk with you all today about how Google's public data commons can help you use data to achieve your own mission and goals and really how public data can, can inform your programs and how your programs and your data can actually also be shared and inform public policy. We're gonna um, dive into Google's data commons and talk a little bit about the idea of um, open collaborative platforms as, as a key part of social change and cooperation across geographies and across sectors. Share a little bit of insights, actually a lot of insights, not a little bit of insights, on how this plays out with um, food uh, insecurity and networks that are seeking to feed others in their community. And then we'll have plenty of time for Q&A. Uh, feel free to drop your questions into chat if that's what's easiest for you or use the Q&A button and, and we'll get to them as we go through the session. All right, with that, let me kick it off by describing or by introducing, I get the order wrong every time, you guys, I'm so sorry, uh, by uh, letting the panelists introduce themselves. So I'm gonna start with you, Eric, and if you can just share a little bit about yourself and the uh, awesome work you're doing down there in South Texas. Well, thank you, Marnie. Um, Eric Cooper, I'm the president and CEO of the San Antonio Food Bank, which is one of the 200 food banks across the United States that make up Feeding America. Privileged to work in the great state of Texas where we have 254 counties, and I have the privilege of serving 29 of those. And so excited to share a little bit more about our work as we move on in the program, but thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much. And uh, Emily. Hey everyone, my name is Emily Ma. I am at Google uh, and I have uh, for many, many years um, uh, worked with across the company, anyone who's interested in working on food insecurity. So whether it's a technologist showing up wanting to contribute in some way or you know, an account manager who's working with a large food company who really wants to get involved. Uh, I've been sort of coordinating all the sort of broader community efforts. Uh, I am here today because I'm thrilled to be able to talk about how we've been able to partner with Feeding America and TechSoup over the last year to drive uh, data commons, which is an initiative uh, that's um, funded and supported by Google, but it's really uh, a sort of philanthropic mission that we have. Thank you, Marnie. That's great. And Mark. Good morning, everyone, or afternoon, depending on your time zones. If you're east of me, uh, I am in Pleasantville, Ohio. Uh, I am the Vice President of Digital Platforms for Feeding America, but first and foremost, I started in this work about 15 years ago as a volunteer in a rural Appalachian food pantry uh, and saw this amazing need to bring data and technology to bear um, for the families that we serve and that we're privileged to work with uh, across this great nation have the um, unique privilege of working with our 200 food bank partners, 60,000 partner agencies, uh, and folks all across the country that help us in this mission to end hunger. Great, thank you very much. Now I'll go into talking a little bit about Google's data commons. So um, we know that data holds stories. The, the challenge with that is, is finding the stories. How do we dive into the data in a way that allows us to bring the context that we have from the work that we do, be able to ask questions of that data and see answers that we can dig into and, and understand more about? This is a tremendously hard problem, right? There's the, the problem of pr the presentation layer. How do we share it? There's the problem of the insights. How do we query and work with the data so that we can get these insights? And there's the enormous problem of just acquiring all the data. 
going to all the places that it might exist in the world and pulling it together so that you can start asking questions of it. And that's exactly where Google's data commons come in, comes in. It allows anyone with an internet connection to be able to access, use, and contribute to public data. So rather than having to go to all of these different sites and, and, and get and find the data, what, what you can do is you can go to datacommons.org and you can ask a question of the data. So you can go in and say, tell me about food insecurity in the United States. And, and what you get back is not a series of links that take you to different websites so that you can start exploring the answer. It's, it's not a generative AI where it's predicting the most likely answer to your request. Instead, what you get back is data. And that data looks like this. It comes from nonprofit contributors like Feeding America, who have made their data available in a format that allows it to be presented in this way. You get data from the uh, global SDG database. The UN has also made their data available so that it can be shown in this way. You get data from the U US census. All of that came back to me on one page when I said, tell me about food insecurity in the United States. And what you can see on this page is I could go in and download that data and I can explore more. So it provides an accessible entry point for me as I start asking questions about the data so that I can start getting insights about the data. Um, Google's data commons is made up of three essential elements. The first one is Google's public data commons. It's what you would see if you go to datacommons.org. It's what I was just showing that I asked that question of. And it is a place where the Google engineering team has done the work of going out to hundreds of different sources, getting their data sets, normalizing them, and putting them inside this one container that allows us to ask questions and get back informative data-driven responses. Second, it's a framework for data publishing. The framework for data publishing, and this is a place where I get super geeky, super fast, so I'm gonna uh, try and keep a lid on it uh, for the point of this conversation, but the, the framework for data publishing is built on schema.org, and it allows us to describe the data in a way that, that, that is not domain specific, so that it can extend and hold a lot of different data and allow you to look at data that may not always be shown together. together. Um, so uh, Lizzie mentioned that this is the second in a series. Um, in the first part of the series, one of our colleagues from Columbia was talking about analyzing the data and that what she saw in looking at GDP and homicide data and the correlation between the two. The lower the homicide rates, the higher the GDP. And that's something that what she was saying is she doesn't usually get those two data sets together in a way that allows her to examine them together. But that's exactly part of what this framework allows us to do. And then the third thing is a suite of tools so that we can actually go in and interrogate the data easily. Some of it is that AI layer I showed earlier where you were, I was able to type in, tell me about food insecurity in the United States and get back a set of answers. It's also the ability to embed some of those answers on a website little bit harder than embedding a Google uh, uh, YouTube video, but not much harder. Um, you can also download entire data sets, or you can collect data points that you're interested in and download those in a single CSV file, whether they're from one data set or whether they're from many data sets. Um, and then you can use a set of APIs, um, which allow you to create things like the food farming and, and climate change website that we showed in, in video form or early on in this. So I just want to give you a few examples of the ways that you can examine uh, the data in, in Google's data commons. Um, these ways, go ahead and jump to the next slide. Um, so these, th there are four of these essentially. One, one is the statistical variable explorer. Um, the statistical variable explorer, what you see on the left side of your screen is like, looks like it's not that much stuff, but it's a lot of stuff. If you look at the numbers next to it, like economy, uh, 105,635 statistical variables are under that. We're not talking about data points or data sets. We're talking about the number of things you can ask a question about. So it allows you to expand that and look at it. And it also gives you the ability to say, actually, I want to look at those variables from these sources. So you can combine that 
and a search tool right in it. You can also use the Place Explorer. The Place Explorer, like this is for the US state of Oklahoma, the, the Place Explorer just lets you put in a place and get back a set of information that has been curated that's generally interesting about a place. It compares it to other nearby places and breaks it down. And each one of these things you can dig in and you can explore more. So uh, you, next you can use the, place ex, the uh, Map Explorer which gives you what you would expect, a map. This is Oklahoma again, broken down by counties. And what we're looking at is the count of tornado events uh, from 2015 to 2023, you know, shaded by county. Um, if we were doing this live, we'd be able to click on any of those counties. We'd be able to examine more information about it and go back to other information about the economy or the demographics or, or whatever we wanted to, to look at there. And then finally, if I'm like, okay, I want to see that on a timeline, though, I can. I'm looking at the exact same data set and the same information in, in a different visualization. And again, I have the ability to download both this image and, and the data set behind the image, or I can embed it so it's live and it gets updated um, you know, on, on my own website. So that, that is just a quick tour of what's available in data commons. What we wanna dive into talking about today is this idea of how tools like this, this set of visualizations, this common schema, this tool that allows us to join data helps create a civil society data platform that allows us to better interrogate the data and better collaborate with one another. A huge part of that collaboration happens because the tooling around this is open source. So it's it's collaborative by design. Um, and I'm gonna turn it over to Emily now to talk a little bit about that. Marnie, thank you so, so much. Uh, we're gonna take a quick second here to do a set change. So if I may share my screen, thank you so much. All right, okay, we're ready to go, right? Okay, so uh, I'm gonna back up a step before diving into data commons and what it does. I want to share a little bit conceptually why the team behind data commons decided to do what they're doing. So this is me. Um, you might not know where this is, but this is a pretty incredible place I got to visit some years ago. This is Muir Woods, Cathedral Grove. And uh, uh, the United Nations, when it was formed by Franklin Roosevelt and others, um, they came together under Cathedral Grove to um, honor Franklin Roosevelt, but to come to an agreement that working together as countries makes sense, right? So uh, I go there pretty often to just reflect on what does it mean to cooperate? And at the end of the day, I'm both a technologist and a philanthropist in the sense that I work very close with google.org, our foundation, and a number of other foundations to find ways to make every dollar go further. In 2022, over $500 billion of philanthropic capital was deployed in, in, in the country. And I bet my bottom dollar that not all those dollars were being used very effectively in the sense that there was probably a lot of duplication of work. And that kind of breaks my heart because I've seen a lot of grant proposals come through. I've been an adjudicator for a number of our open calls for the foundation on food and ag. And everybody starts with, we're gonna go and collect the data we're gonna build a proprietary platform. We're going to analyze the data. And then if we have any time left at the very end, then we're gonna go do some really interesting things that only we can do because we're scientists or we're you know, um, experts in the field. And, and that, that's a little bit weird for me to sort of see all of these patterns show up. And I think there's a better way. So I'm gonna share a story about a fly. Um, uh, the, the fruit fly specifically. Uh, so my colleague, John Day Richter, uh, was very early on in the genomics uh, uh, work about 25 years ago. And, um, you know, the genome belongs to us as people. I would consider that something public domain. We are all human beings and we all have genes. Uh, at this point, about 20 years ago, 25 years ago, um, Pfizer was going to patent this, right? And they were going to make it proprietary. And that didn't seem right. At the same time, there were academic institutions all over the world, in Europe, in the United States, in Asia, all basically applying to the governments for grants to do exactly what I said, right? Every academic institution was like, we're gonna hire three software engineers, four developers, 
We're going to find the data. We're going to build the platform. We're going to engineer something proprietary. And then we're going to do the really amazing science on top of that, right? And these are scientists, right? We're talking about biology departments and genomics departments. They are not software engineers or developers. So the NIH and the European equivalent was like, this doesn't make sense. We're going to be to toying way more money than we need to. And all of these academic institutions are literally going to be fighting for the same great software engineers and developers to build the foundation infrastructure for the work that needs to happen. So in essence, what played out was all of these organizations eventually coming together and saying, okay, there should be some things that let's centralize and do together and do better together. And then there's some things that only all these universities can do on their own, which is the science. So um, an incredible professor by the name of Michael Ashburner basically brought everyone together and decided not only on the fundamental infrastructure, so the source code to develop everything on top of, but a common language to articulate what was happening. And so rather than you say tomato, I say tomato, right? They all agreed that it was going to be tomato. And that made the genomics research world completely explode in a really positive way. Everybody got further together faster. And that's why we come together and do the open source work. So you might ask, what is open source software? What's you know a standard taxonomy? right? There's three characteristics. It's really, really straightforward. Number one, it's open. So you can go on the internet and basically see all of it, right? None of it is opaque. None of it is transparent. Anyone can read it. Anyone can understand what's happening with it. Uh, and, and nobody can suddenly stick it in a wall garden and, and hold it for their own. The second thing is it's shared. So uh, I actually believe that in certain cases, it makes sense because the problem solving, if there's errors, if there's issues, happens faster if there are more eyes from more perspectives on the common infrastructure. And then finally, it's flexible. I think this is a really, really important thing for me to uh, double down on because a lot of people are like, oh, open source, it must be free, right? And it must be only for nonprofits. That is not the case. Um, there are many, many different kinds of licensees. The most free and permissive licensees like Apache um, and Creative Commons 4, you can build a for-profit company on top of open source software. And the truth of the matter is you're probably using it right now. You probably, if you're on a computer right now, if you are on Zoom, if you, are have, if you have a cell phone, you're probably using open source software in some format right now. And there are some very, very big for-profit companies, including Google, who have benefited from open source. And we also in turn give back to the community. So we have a very large team that basically gives free software and data commons is an example of that, right? So you give, but you get, and that's how this world has put itself together in the last 30 years. So again, open solutions are not necessarily best for everyone. I'm going to articulate why, uh, you know, there's certain cases where you are a for-profit company and you want to own a domain and you want to, you believe that if you made a like run at it, you're going to be able to be the largest organization in the space. Um, that's probably not for you. You probably want to protect your intellectual property. But in the case where we're trying to solve for systems problems, where, you know, the, the situation is distributed, it's complex, there's many organizations already involved, you know, we probably all want to come together and share in the benefits of building a single sort of infrastructure that we all collectively choose to build together and define their requirements together. The second thing is when standardization matters, um, open source can be really, really positive. So again, um, yeah, I've mentioned you say tomato, I say tomato, right? Uh, it really helps that we speak all the same language, right? And, when, and that helps us share. So I will share an example of schema.org and how that really helped um, the job market actually uh, and recruiting firms get a lot better at this. And then finally, uh, in many cases where there is a triple bottom line um, effort ongoing, transparency doesn't matter, right? When it, there's a social justice component, when there's an environmental component, um, transparency helps to, to be able to really get down to the, the root of what's happening. Okay, so um, I had the privilege to work with Marnie and Mark and a number of organizations around how might we move more food, surplus food in the country to where it needs to be. And we were 
building out about a year ago something called open product recovery. And we chose to make these standards and the um, reference code public because we saw a couple of characteristics. And I want to make this concrete as just an example of why we decided to not be a closed walled garden, but uh, an open source project, um, just to kind of illustrate why. So number one, uh, food waste and food surplus and food recovery is a huge and distributed problem. There are probably 100,000 organizations in the US working on recovering surplus food and moving it to people in need. The second thing is standardization does matter. And I, I, I keep going back to tomato versus tomato. Uh, it's amazing looking at the records of food that's been recovered and how it's been described. And, you know, it, 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 it's a, a bit of friction, right? So if I'm trying to describe, I have a ton of, you know, to, tomatoes and then somebody in the Northeast doesn't understand what I'm saying, they might not say yes to taking that lot of tomatoes and distributing it for me because they're not sure what I have. Third thing is um, there are a lot of silos in the space uh, and, and it, it takes time to find the right um, organization to recover that food. So how do we shorten that time frame? especially because food doesn't last forever, right? You know, there is a ticking time clock on, on you know, those tomatoes. And then finally, how do we build the trust and the persistence together with this organization or these organizations? And so um, we wanted the transparency in order to ensure that everybody um, could see what was going on uh, and, 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 and not feel like there was something they had to work through in terms of the opaqueness and the silos. So three more case studies, and then I'm going to hand over to Mark and Eric to really dive in since they really are the experts in the space. So there's the parable of the old man and the sons. Um, and, and the idea here is that if each of the old man's sons has one stick, you can break the stick very easily, right? And what this old man did, uh, trying to demonstrate to his sons to work together was he bundled the sticks and it's much harder to break the bundle of sticks once you have them all bundled together. So three examples from, from my world that you might already be using. Number one, uh, this is my favorite because I think many people have a cell phone. Um, about um, 20 years ago, again, uh, something called the Open Handset Alliance came together. And this is why there are 3.5 billion users of Android phones in the world. So iPhones about 1.5, Android 3.5 billion users, because every single handset manufacturer out there was trying to build their own proprietary hardware, own proprietary software, and it was costing everybody a lot of money. This group came together and said, let's come together and agree on a set of common standards about the software and the hardware, and then we're all going to win together faster. And so this was what actually drove the proliferation of mobile phones in all sorts of parts of the world that might not have afforded it in the first place. So um, again, uh, you might ask, wow, Google does Android, great. Um, you must make a lot of money off of it. I will also mention that it is an open source project. You can find the source code of the Android operating system. And uh, companies like Xiaomi in China literally have built incredible public for-profit companies with Google making no money at all. So we were willing to make that bet because we believed that the pie was big enough for everyone. And we were gonna create more pies together versus fighting over the same piece of pie. Okay, second uh, example that I mentioned earlier, job postings. Uh, if you can believe it, uh, many moons ago before multiple tech companies and multiple companies in the sort of job uh, and recruiting space on the internet um, came together. Everybody had a different format for how they would describe a job posting, right? It's kind of mind blowing, right? You're kind of like, okay, well, there must be sort of a title, maybe a salary range, maybe like a location. Like you would think that everybody would agree on like how to describe a job posting, but no, everybody thought it was proprietary. That was kind of silly. Everybody came together and said, okay, let's agree on a common way to describe a job posting. And what happened afterwards is, you know, monster.com and career, you know, development.com started cross-listing their postings, right? And sharing in the revenue. It, it was better for users because if I'm looking for a job as a developer, I would be able to see a job posting for a particular company on multiple sites versus having to go to one site for job postings in the Northeast, another site for job postings in the Southwest, right? They would all cross-list and they would share and everybody benefited as a result. Uh, I believe this is my second to last final example. Um, this one is one of my favorites because it really demonstrated Feeding America coming together. Eric Cooper is on this map. 
Uh, Mark Malenkoff is overseeing a lot of the work with his colleague, Stephanie Zydek. Um, a couple of years ago, I, I had the privilege and honor with my team to work with Feeding America to see what we could do if we could put all the sourcing data from across the country of seven food banks into a single platform and see if there are ways that we could get better together, right? So what we learned from even the initial analysis just before Thanksgiving, about four years ago, was a lot of food banks were sourcing from the same growers. So Thanksgiving dinner was actually more costly than it needed to be, even when purchased at a discount. So if they could purchase together from the same farmer, 10 times as many cranberries versus each one pound of cranberries on their own, one ton of cranberries on their own, right? There was an opportunity there, but that required each food bank to share into something called member data sharing services. That is now um, become something incredible. Some 50 plus food banks are part of that. And they're seeing so many opportunities to now work together as a network at that level. But it required the bravery and the courage to put their data into a common platform. So this was a public blog. If you want to read it, I will share the link shortly. And a final example, I will leave you with this. As philanthropists, as policymakers, as technologists, I want to see data commons at the end of the day really help us help the, our, our government representatives uh, really articulate their stories in a data-driven way. So I had the opportunity to speak to Congressman Duarte. Um, he represents the 13th district in California. He has some really incredible counties that are part of our food production system in the United States and beyond. Um, here's a really quick map that would have potentially taken him a couple of months to put together. So um, you can go onto Data Commons and literally type in, show me the maximum temperature projections uh, based on the climate work from the IPCC compared to food insecurity and show me how this lays out on a scatter plot. Right. We know that for a fact that as temperatures rise, as heat becomes an issue, uh, that that will aggravate all sorts of things and that will trickle down to impacting food insecurity. So should we not focus on the counties in California where I live, where there is already significant food insecurity and the temperature is going to rise more than other counties? So I'm not worried about Santa Clara County where I live right now and the two million people here as much as I am worried about Merced County because they are not only experiencing more food insecurity now per capita, they are going to see a maximum temperature that's gonna be much greater than what I'm experiencing here. So I literally click three buttons to get this map, right? I would normally have had to download from the IPCC a bunch of climate data, figure out how to use it, download a bunch of data from Feeding America, figure out how to combine that with the IPCC data, and then maybe finally get an answer. Data Commons makes quick analyses like this very, very, very easy. So I'll stop there, happy to discuss more. You know how to find me, emilyma at google.com. Happy to answer any questions. Over to you, Marnie. Awesome, thank you so much, Emily. Um, I've got a couple questions for you, but I'm gonna save them until we get to the question and answer part um, and uh, prioritize questions that, that come in. Folks, feel free to drop them into chat or drop them into the Q&A. Um, next up is, as Emily said, our colleagues from Feeding America National and the San Antonio Food Bank, uh, Mark and, and Eric. And I think, Mark, you've, you've got some slides you're driving for both of you. Is that true? That is correct. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, I will so hand it over. Can, yep. Hopefully you can see my slides okay. They're beautiful. Okay, well, I don't know if they're beautiful or not. I am uh, an IT guy and not a Google slide expert. And uh, in, in no way did I have Bard uh, actually help me with my slides today. I probably should have. Um, but what I wanted to share is uh, one of you of the Feeding America Network. I know there are uh, were well known across the country, but maybe not so well known uh, on a broader and more global audience. The Feeding America Network, and we always use the big N, um, that our network is a big tent and that hunger is everywhere. Uh, 200 plus food banks uh, across our nation, 60,000 partner agencies. So individual charity uh, organizations, that come together uh, as well as our national office organization that uh, helps us 
work to end hunger every day in this country, uh, using the idea, the public data for uh, really big good. Um, our network itself is, uh, as I said, 200 food banks across the 50 states, the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico make up our network. And then we have affiliated relationships with the Global Food Banking Network as well. Um, I, I mentioned big data for good, big good. This is a, a title I used to use for a, uh, for a TED style talk that I would give uh, uh, when I was working at one of our largest food banks here in the, here in the country. Um, but together we have this bold aspiration, which is to cut food insecurity in half uh, to below at or below 5% by the year 2030. And more importantly, to reduce place and race-based disparities uh, in all of the places across this country that we serve. Food banks, food pantries that are part of this network serve every zip code, every census tract, and hunger lives in all of those places. Um, I'll do the same kind of thing that uh, that Emily did, maybe not as articulately as she did, but these are some actual slides uh, from the old school way, I'll say circa 2017, 2018, when we were trying to do really deep analysis to understand hunger localized. Uh, first, we started with a whiteboard drawing and, a, and um, my CEO from my food bank coming over and saying, I think we need to put a food pantry here and here and here and here on a map. And, um, you know, in the Edwards Deming uh, famous quote of, well, that's great, but uh, let me see some data about that. Um, we started with that premise. We stitched together uh, all of these data sets, the public American community survey data uh, ArcGIS uh, shape files, our internal private data. And what it allowed us to do was take the premise of this, uh, of this great hand-drawn map from my, from my whiteboard um, to, okay, well, now we can break uh, these maps happen to be Franklin County, Ohio, or Columbus, Ohio, uh, for... Um, for folks who are football fans uh, or not, uh, Ohio State University is located kind of right in the center uh, center of this area. Um, some of the things that we always knew about our community was uh, we understood the impacts of prior decisions over the years, uh, all the way back to things like the redlining maps from the early uh, 1930s to the interstate highway system that cut through Columbus, uh, just like every major city in the country. Um, this little weird map that looks like a T down in the lower uh, center of the center, that's right where the highway system cut right through uh, neighborhoods. And guess what? Those are the areas where we're still seeing poverty um, we use data to create some highlights of like, okay, these are the hot spots of where we know there is poverty and hunger. Uh, we further went on to marry up our most private data, I'll say. Um, and this map is a little bit hard to read and that's a bit intentional because every dot on this map is the rooftop uh, within 110 meter precision of neighbors we call them neighbors or clients, the people that we serve of their households uh, over the course of a year and a half's worth of services. Uh, this created a bit of a heat map, but you can still even see the outline of that upside down T for how uh, hunger was dispar uh, the disparities around hunger were centered in 15 what we called zones, which made up of about 150 census tracts. Um, but this, this took a long time. In fact, this took several years because we had to download, we had to write APIs to figure out how to get data from the American Community Survey, marry that up to our own internal data warehouse, match it, uh, geocode all of those rooftops and get to this data. But it allowed us to do something uh, quite remarkable. When we were looking for 
places where those dots ought to be. And my uh, my food bank CEO, a gentleman by the name of Matt Hobash, who's the longest serving CEO, second longest serving CEO in the Feeding America Network, uh, in his 39th year, we we drew that map, and he said, "Oh, I think we need one here." Well, in fact, it ended up being two census tracts to the west, um, and. A few months ago, Good Morning America uh, came out to film a segment, and it aired uh, about hunger in Ohio and generally hunger across the United States. The place where they were filming this interview, and they were in one of a, one of the food pantries, a large uh, food pantry operation, sat right in the census tract of where the data told us to put it. Now. That was a lot of lift to get us there over the over the years. The promise of data commons and bringing our data together helps us do that, just as Emily showed in her slides, uh, with a few clicks. So one of the things that we did uh, was share something we call our Map the Meal Gap data. This is um, a large data study that Feeding America has done for years and years that helps us pinpoint where are the most hungry people in our country and how do we best serve them? We took that data, which has always been available on our Feeding America website, but shared that into Data Commons in such a way that we could begin to map things like food insecurity data in Data Commons. Um, so today uh, you can go to datacommons.org type in what I did here, which is how many people in the U.S. face food insecurity? Uh, and up comes the data. Um, if we were to type in, in substituting uh, Texas for, uh, for the U.S., this would drill into that. We could then ask further the questions, uh, what counties in Texas? Well, uh, my friend Eric is going to talk about the 29 counties that are part of the San Antonio Food Bank in Southwest Texas and Bear County, uh, where San Antonio is, but uh, also all of the rural areas. Hunger is very localized. Um, then one of the amazing things, as we began working with Data Commons last year, we, uh, in partnership with uh, Emily and Guha and the entire team from Data Commons, created datacommons.feedingamerica.org. Um, one of the first questions that I was like asking, in fact, when uh, Guha and Emily and I met for the very first time, uh, was an example that we had tried to do with our Department of Health, which was to match up data from the 500 Cities Project, for those of you familiar with the CDC data, uh, around health and health disparities. Um, I said, boy, wouldn't it be interesting to see the correlation uh, or the intersection of hunger uh, and heart disease, for example. And in two clicks, uh, it was up on the screen. Uh, it was one of these uh, many thousands and thousands, in fact, uh, nearly 30,000 data sets connected into datacommons.feedingamerica.org. Uh, so that was instantly accessible to us. And that allowed uh, us to have a view of this uh, for folks who go to datacommons.feedingamerica.org, you, you'll actually see this on the home page and a link right through to this particular graph. When you hover over any one of these dots, it'll bring up the exact county that's represented by that dot. Uh, and then it'll let you drill into about 80 data points about that county, a county and its surrounding areas. So just a tremendous tool that we would have never, ever been able to build. I mean, maybe if I was at it for 100 years, uh, but uh, not in the way that we're able to do that now. Uh, so a really powerful tool. I want to turn over to Eric. Uh, Eric and I, you know, full disclosure, Eric and I have been working together on this work for the best part of a decade since I had the pleasure to start working with him. Um, he is one of the most dynamic leaders in our Feeding America network, has been honored in many ways. Um, when he's not on webinars like this, uh, you can usually find him out in service to people who are facing hunger, uh, or you can catch him at a Whataburger uh, somewhere in Southwest Texas. Uh, Eric, I'll let you uh, talk a bit about your network and uh, we'll roll through these slides. 
You bet. Well, thanks, Mark. Well, I am uh, just so excited to be a part of this panel. Like I called my mom this morning saying that I was going to be on a group with with Google and TechSoup and Feeding America. And so it, it, it is like I'm giddy, um, but I'm hoping to maybe take it from the cloud uh, to the ground, right? How, how these tools are maybe delivered. Um, but I do want to point out what Emily shared earlier. Um, and that is this open source concept, uh, as a, as an operating nonprofit serving needy Texans, uh, we are oftentimes supported with philanthropy that comes with a level of restriction. And so if you're ever tempted to give a gift to an organization and impose a platform that doesn't hold to these kind of strategies of really cooperative um, data sharing and information. Um, those closed platforms that sometimes are um, forced on nonprofits can sometimes create redundancy of the nonprofit managing multiple platforms. Um, and so the workload to do that. Um, so just encourage any of those vendors in the space to play nice, play well with others, uh, I, I love the, you know, alone you go fast, but together we go far. So uh, we use a framework um, of today, tomorrow, and a lifetime. And it really is meeting our neighbors' immediate needs for food today and groceries and meals. Uh, but we really bring household stabilization with our tomorrow work, which is enrolling families in SNAP and WIC, uh, Medicaid, long-term care for seniors, children's health insurance programs, some some federal subsidies that sometimes our neighbors are unaware of, or maybe they can't navigate those state applications uh, effectively. And so we really do a lot of work in that space. And actually, it's the larger benefit of than the physical food that we, we deliver. And then lastly, our commitment to really help people work according to their ability and receive according to need. We have our lifetime work, which is dedicated to workforce development, job training, job placement. And we absolutely can't do that alone. We've got a great um, a cohort of nonprofits and, and uh, higher education that deliver some amazing tracks that move our families uh, forward. So the 29 counties I mentioned earlier, this is what it looks like. It's a, it's a large section. So if you, if you wanna think about the drive from Coke uh, I'm a Diet Coke guy, but this is uh, the real deal. Uh, down to LaSalle, it would take you about eight hours. Um, so it's a it's a pretty good distance um, that we cover uh, a lot of a lot of miles, a, a lot of land. Uh, but in these 29 counties is roughly 2.7 million people, um, and so our opportunity is to use that public data that Marnie talked about. I mean. Uh, boy, population data, poverty data, USDA has food insecurity data. You saw it kind of displayed in our map the meal gap to better understand where the population in need lives. And then our opportunity is really combining then the local data that we're collecting to gain insights. And so, um, you know, how can we shift from talking about food insecurity to nutrition security, right? Because that's ultimately what it's about. It's about making sure that our neighbors are nourished. Uh, in our Food for a Lifetime, we, we also deliver nutrition education and our nutritionists often say to me, Eric, it's not nutritious unless they eat it. Um, and so that, that challenge of the right food, right amount, right time is something that local food banks are trying to do. But we're really trying to make sure that we, that we get the food that families need to, to better nourish their children. Um, many of them are dealing with chronic diseases. Um, and so uh, as we look into our donation stream, um, we, we handle uh, hundreds of thousands of SKUs. So different product types and data that it can be overwhelming. We lump it generally into dry, refrigerated and frozen just to talk about it. But there's all of this data that, um, that we have. And sometimes when you think about where food comes from that's donated to a food bank, it's, it's food in the margin. It's, it's short dated, it's, it's uh, 
close to an expiration date. It might be a really ripe produce and um, all of that food that comes in sometimes can be criticized. Like, Hey, did you really get your neighbor the best food? We have this data point of pounds and sometimes pounds are probably talked about more than anything, but it's just a measure. Uh, we can convert pounds into meals. Uh, 1.28 pounds is roughly a meal. And then we can talk about what it's worth. You know, what is the value of that? But uh, oftentimes when people are saying, Eric, what are you doing to nourish our neighbors? What are you doing around nutrition security? Um, you know, we, we struggle. We, well, we got a lot of data. And so in partnership with Google and Stanford, we really looked at our inventory mix, what, what we took in and, and, you know, how is it comprised of that refrigerated frozen and um, dry. And what we learned from this member data sharing that um, Emily talked about with a cohort of food banks, all of our inventory was kind of combined. Um, and we looked at the commonalities. Uh, we also then looked at, you know, USDA's guidelines around uh, healthy eating. And it's really highlighted in what's called the healthy eating index. This is kind of an algorithm that really helps um, all of us understand um, the quality uh, of the food that is nourishing our bodies. And so here's some of the data that you can see that kind of what the um, healthy eating index uh, is all about. And so uh, we are committed to try to procure as much of the best quality, what's the most nutritious pound of food. And in partnership with Stanford and some great minds and students, they um, started to look at all right, what is the makeup of the inventory that's actually in our food banks? And this graph just shows, man, the complexity of some of those items and the nutritional breakdown. Um, uh, it is uh, started to get exciting when we started to see like, where do we trend compared to the average American diet, right? So if someone's going to the grocery store and getting their own food, you know, where do they score? And then because food banks are distributing food, it's a self-selected uh, uh, variety because you know we don't have all of the items in the grocery store. We just have what's donated. What was the nutritional mix of what was donated? You can see this starts to trend. So on this graph, you can start to see the uh, average American diet compared to the US food supply and the average American diet scores just below a 60. That's just individual shoppers. And then when you look at that compared to the um, average food bank inventory, those within the member data sharing, you could see that the inventory mix is actually healthier uh, coming from a food bank than the average American diet. So as I try to explain to somebody, hey, um, what is the nutritional mix of the food that the food bank's distributing? It's data that's coming from, again, those national sources with those local sources that really start to paint the picture. Now, I know as you're watching this, you're going, what happened in 2016? And we are trying to unpack, yeah, exactly what that, um, that anomaly is. And But we, we would, would not have known if it wouldn't have been for, for Google Google Commons, Feed in America, TechSoup, and our good friends at Stanford. So, you know, how do you start to really make decisions? And, you know, I, I think these leading indicators, uh, Marnie teed up, you know, policymakers, when you can start to show them what's actually happening, uh, Feeding America has a tool called Service Insights on Meal Connect that gives us the opportunity to look at real time data. So, you know, the national data from USDA and what uh, the food insecurity rate and the population in need in a county might be, but combining it with our real-time data helps to educate people on what exactly is happening. And it gives us the ability to pivot, which we had to do in San Antonio at the onset of the pandemic. Um, many of you might've seen an aerial photo that was taken uh, by a newspaper here in San Antonio called the Express News and uh, a photographer uh, named William Luther. And he captured 
an image, which was a line of cars uh, that were gathered at a food distribution. Um, and prior to that day, we were looking similar to the data that Mark showed around the T, we have a smile. Um, and some of our local nonprofits maybe inappropriately call it the poverty smile. It's this, it's this belt that as you look at it, um, it, it, it's smiling back at you, but it is the population of our community that really struggles, our neighbors in need. And, and we had set up this distribution at a, um, knowing that we needed to be right in community um, on the south side of our city. At, we found a large parking lot at a swap meet called Trader's Village that had a huge, huge tarmac for us to be able to, to meet the need that we could see coming from the real-time data. Um, and uh, boy, we were prepared to meet that demand. It ended up being one of the largest food distributions in America, 10,000 cars, 50,000 people, 22 semi-truck loads of food, sun up to sundown. Um, we were able to meet the need by forecasting what we were seeing in our data analytics to make a pivot to send more food, get the ingredients that the families would need. And I woke up the next morning to calls from you know, USA Today, CNN, Dr. Phil, to talk about 72 different countries around the world uh, wanted to understand the line and what the pandemic was going to be ushering in in families meeting basic needs. Um, you know, I stayed to the end of that distribution and uh, made sure every car was served, but it was in loading the last minivan that I met a husband and wife and their three kids that uh, when, I, when, I, when I met them, I wanted to apologize that it had taken so long. And they said they knew it was going to be a long wait, but they were so grateful to get food. Um, they shared they met working at this hotel in our downtown uh, and got married, bought their home and started to grow their family. Uh, they said they knew something was wrong, you know, when the general manager called them to come into the hotel uh, at the same time because they worked uh, one worked the day shift, one worked the night shift. And, um, and the general manager just said, Hey, no guests, no, no money, no jobs. And they were both laid off at the exact same time. And they, they got into that minivan and drove home worried about their health insurance, you know, where they were going to, you know, if they were to get the virus, how would they handle that? They worried about making their house payment. They worried about how they were going to nourish their children. And as I loaded those groceries into the back of their minivan, the three heads of their children popped up and they were just so excited to be able to, to have nourishment that we would have not been prepared to meet that demand had it not been for data to be able to act, pivot and meet that need. So excited to answer some questions, uh, but I truly am grateful to all of those that have made this possible. Um, all the employees at Google, the great partners at TechSoup. I have been in this work for about 30 years uh, and I've seen the work at TechSoup and how they're impacting uh, so many organizations. So thank you for joining us and uh, I'll pivot back to the group. That's terrific. Thank you, uh, Eric, Mark, Emily, so much for the storytelling and for diving into what data can do for us. So now, you know, let's just open it up for some questions and answers. So feel free to drop any questions into, into Slack or into the q and I'm going to start with a, a couple of questions that, that I have. And, um, and Eric, I'm going to start with you, actually. One of the things I hear and what you are talking about is just your desire to serve the whole person. Like that's who you're serving. You're not just serving the, the hungry belly or the individual that can't make it, you know, afford to go to the grocery store or get their food needs met in conventional ways, but the whole person. And that requires collaboration with other organizations in your community. I, I'm wondering how you see um, both shared sources of public data 
So you're sort of, you know, able to equally access public data and some of the leading indicators that you were talking about, but also how you see the ability to share data between the organizations, data that you all may have as helping one another, you know, either meet needs or identify future needs or, or, or whatever else may come. Yeah, Marnie, thank you for that question. I, I There's so many aspects of information. As Mark mentioned, 60,000 uh, agencies that the 200 food banks serve. And in our 29 counties, we have about 875 of those 60,000. And so these are independent nonprofit organizations, churches, um, schools. And, and as they talk about the need, as they see the lines that are forming at their senior center or homeless shelter or food pantry, um, our ability to share the insights of the demographics of that population and, and what's trending uh, at the food pantries. Um, one of the biggest variables is using this information for sustainability, right? Um, it's data that can be used in grants and proposals um, to, to better get the support that these 875 organizations need. Um, another aspect is th that that local proprietary data that comes through um, our member data sharing in the inventory. And so what's the financial impact of the food that we're distributing together, right? When you think about, you know, I had one of our 825 partners come to me and say, Eric, we realized that you're our largest donor. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, well, you know, when you value the food that a food bank might be providing a partner, and she said, I challenged all of our other donors oh. to match it. Wow. And so it's just been incredible to be able to, to, to share that information so that everyone benefits um, and not just using the data um, to, to solely benefit one organization. Um, so, Thank you very much. That, that actually leads wonderfully into a question I, I have for you, Mark. I, you know, data sharing in this way at the organizational level is challenging. When we share data, and I'm, I'm going to include TechSoup in that we, when we share data, we've often locked it inside a PDF, and we're sharing it so nested into our own insights that somebody else can't take it apart and interrogate it or have different insights. I think what you all have done, not just in making your data available on your site, but so that I can query it and look at it against USDA data or SDG data. It, it, Feeding America is informing me with the same level of provenance that these other organizations are, but also I can interrogate the data. I can download it and use it in the same way. That, that, that I would think takes a, a lot of organizational courage and maybe some uh, long time persuading. And I'm, I'm wondering if you can talk about what, what it took to get to a place where you could share data in that kind of systemic way. Uh, well, Marnie, it, uh, yeah, uh, I'm not from Texas, but I do wear a bit of a cowboy hat at times. Uh, <laughs> um, so it, yes, it takes a bit, it takes a lot of organizational courage um, and, and even a personal level of courage to say, we want to set this free because there's so much more to learn from it. Uh, the examples, the few slides that Eric ran through about the project that the students from Stanford did along with the Hoover Fellowship was a perfect example of that. We had a data set of about 6.6 .6 million lines of that receipt data. And honestly, Eric and I have laughed about this. The only thing that we were hoping to achieve out of it by releasing this data um, was to just figure out how many apples versus applesauce versus apple butter and figure out that butter and apple butter aren't the same things yeah. across all of this data. Well, the brilliant students who we then let that data go to, we we did anonymize it in a way um, that could be reverse engineered. So when the data came back to us, we could at least get a sense for what food bank it came from. Um, but when we when we set that free, we were hoping for outcome A. <laughs> well, um, 
Tushar and the other students from Stanford who worked on this project uh, did something totally unexpected. They said, after they figured out the apples, the applesauce and the apple butter, uh, they said, well, let's smash this up against the USDA uh, data and the healthy eating index. And out came what we just showed, this idea that, huh, food banks aren't all full of tuna and tuna helper. Um, and that is such an old narrative and an old, I, I talked about old school and data assembly. Now that's like old school cassette tapes when you when you roll back. Our network uh, on a, as a whole rescues well more than a billion pounds of fresh produce every year mm -hmm. and moves that through to roughly 18 and a half million households. So setting the data free, having the courage to do that provides a way for somebody to see something in the data that all of us who are so close to it wouldn't have seen or wouldn't have asked. Um, it's it's the thing that when uh, when we first got introduced to data commons, one of the things that uh, Guha had as a uh, RV Guha, the the founder and creator of Data Commons, uh, said to us was, you know, this can be a tool for citizen scientists, citizen mm -hmm. journalists, and citizen analysts. Um, so that's why we we wanted to be bold about this. Uh, that that's awesome, and 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 uh, I, I do think it takes a tremendous amount of organizational courage and putting a stake in the ground. It would be wonderful, actually, to you guys were up for it to to document some of it in a case study because I think this is a challenge organizations face. How does that impassioned integrator? convince the executives in their organization or the board in their organization to release data in a way that allows other people to manipulate it. I think that's what gets so scary. You know, we want to own the all of the narrative, but this thing that allows for people to build narratives based on context is tremendously valuable. Um, you, you, Emily, it also, you, you talked when you were talking about the value of open source, and I think that's that's part of convincing one another that we should be releasing our data, right? Is that it can allow for collaboration. You talked about what agreeing to a set of data standards and, and implicitly sharing data with those data standards meant for you know, genome research, right? The example I often use when I talk about um, open source is um, a slightly more dire example. It's of the Oakland Hills fire in 1991. Mm -hmm when the Oakland Hills were burning and San Francisco firefighters showed up to help, their hoses didn't fit the hydrants. Ugh. So they yeah. brought their trucks into the hills and, and couldn't help because they used two different standards in these neighboring cities. And in fact, the firefighters that came in from around the area couldn't couldn't connect. So I, th I think you, you have this spot where we're talking about the explosion of innovation and possibility and new discoveries that happens. We're yes. also talking, I think, about the ability to collaborate when, in unplanned, unexpected events. Yeah, it was un the firefighters had the intention of collaborating, but they they would need those fire trucks in those hills was unplanned, and so they didn't have the infrastructure to collaborate. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, Eric, when you were talking about the line of cars during the pandemic, that's a great example of we have the intention to collaborate. We have an unexpected event and we need to have the infrastructure to collaborate. Now, I wonder, Emily, if, if you can talk just a little bit about a, a little bit more, because you did talk about this, but a little bit more about how how opening up standards and making our data available helps provide both the, the potential for a explosion of possibility, but so that we can come together when circumstances drive us to do something unexpected. Sure, sure. Um, so, you know, Marnie, your story, your dire example is is heartbreaking. I'll share one that's a little bit more uplifting that um, takes us <laughs> hundred years, maybe, uh, having to do with communication. So um, if you can believe it, um, many, many moons ago, every country had a different gauge wire for telephony, right? So mm -hmm. we had to have these crazy switchboards all over the world. 
uh, to just talk to, you know, a friend in another country, right? So I'm Canadian. If I had to call home from the United States to Canada, I was like, you know, oh my God, the two countries use completely different gauge wire, right? And, and this was how it all started until, you know, an international group came together and realized that this was silly. And uh, <laughs> let's agree, it, it's not like it's proprietary, what gauge wire <laughs> that you use to build your telephony systems. And so that allowed yeah. for international communication to be way easier and less full of friction. And so, you know, um, maybe rather than digging deeper, I'll, I'll share a couple of thoughts in terms of, you know, how I think about this. Um, you know, it, it doesn't matter if you're in government or in academia or in nonprofit or for profit. I oftentimes ask myself the question of, okay, we have a challenge in front of it. Should we build it ourselves because nothing exists? Should we partner with someone to do it together? Or should we just buy it? Because there's actually an example out there that is like already really well developed and kind of incredible, right? Um, and, and I think oftentimes, and, and I am a, 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 a fault, right? It's like, well, if it wasn't built here, it's not good enough, right? That happens. Actually, I have some incredible engineers I've worked with who are like, I'm really smart, so I'm going to build the thing, <laughs> except somebody else has already built it and maintains it, right? So I would encourage folks out there, whatever organization you're in, um, what is the end goal that you have and what is the most efficient way to achieve that end goal? And it might not always be um, you, know, you yourself building it. Um, it. You might end up in a better place by either collaborating to build it together or <laughs> literally buying it, right? <laughs> if it already exists. And, um, I think with systems challenges uh, such as food insecurity, um, that question becomes really pertinent because we have so many people waiting outside, you know, like looking for food support, and there it's it's there's not a lot of time and not a lot of resources, and we have to connect that. And so um, maybe maybe that's my answer for you is you know rather than specifically on data, it's philosophically how do we approach problem solving? How do we step up? Um, and, and, and be the best that we can be, you know, in the food waste space, I say a lot about, you know, where is, where does this food serve its highest and best use? And sometimes it's not necessarily going to, you know, a hunger relief organization, it might actually be better to send it to animal feed. And I would ask philosophically and abstractly that question of, of everyone here and, and data, same, same here, right? Like, do you need to keep it proprietary, right? What, what purpose does it serve? Um, are you doing it because, you know, you're afraid that, you know, that there might be um, adverse consequences and are those fears true, right? Um, you know, I think I, 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 I um, owe, owe a world of gratitude to Mark and, and Eric for doing what they did because they really led the way in showing what partnership and collaboration could do. But they had to overcome not only their individual fears, but their organizational fears. And um, I would queer, I would interrogate the fears that you have in sharing. Um, and, and uh, you know, actually, I was talking to Julie Yurko yesterday, another member of the early seven. Uh, and she said, you know, Colin Powell will say that optimism is what amplifies and I prefer to live my life, um, you know, in, in an optimistic fashion. How about that? That's a very long winded answer, not very much about data. But I really truly believe that it comes down to um, querying why. Yeah. We want why we are default not sharing, right? Yeah, I, I, I think that's a that's a great framing, and I, lo I love the the framing of of optimism and possibility, um, in there, and and also I think it's at the fact that so much of data is social. We collect it because of social interactions. It happens because of social, you know, but it also, you know, whether we share it or not, our response to it is how we show up in our community. And, you know, and I think when we start thinking about how do we move to a mode where it's, the you know, the default is share, hmm. you, you know, when, when we've gotten to software as a service, we don't have to think about saving our documents anymore, you know, in, in quite the same way. Um, and, and now, you know, how do we move data in that direction? How do we move where the default is sharing? And, you know, one of the things that we talked about when we were prepping for this section session is um, is is the role that foundations or governments can take in helping shift the default. The question, though, is how do they shift the default without putting the burden 
on small overstretched organizations to say now suddenly you have to become an expert in data standards and you have to become an expert in sharing and you have to you know abstract your data so that it's not attached to a, to Marnie Webb you, you know it's it's a person with this demographic profile that that got a, got a set of food that's being aggregated with other people so that we can say something about it and I I wonder Eric. Um, if, if you can, I'm going to go around and ask all of you actually, but if you can start off talking a little bit about what role you think foundations have in helping create this data infrastructure, recognizing this tension of, of you know, the possibility of transferring the burden to these small organizations. Yeah, Marnie, thank you. And, you know, I think for me, it's the fear of the fruit smoothie, right? Smoothies are delicious. They're easy to consume. They're nourishing. Uh, nonprofits want to be a fruit salad, right? They want to they want to know that they're identified as a unique fruit within a bowl or a collaborative. Uh, I think what's cool about Data Commons is, man, they do you right. They make sure that the the source is credited. That that your identity is protected, right? And I think that's one of the critical things because nonprofits have to tell their story. They have to show that they're delivering and so that the foundations are giving to them. But I think from the encouragement to this audience, like encourage the nonprofits to be in that fruit bowl. And if it starts to drive to a fruit smoothie, if you start to feel like you're all blended up and lost, know that you contributed, know that you're contributing to outcomes. Uh, it, I mentioned it earlier, the redundancy um, in neighbor referral platforms is where we see it most often. There's a dozen different um, you know, platforms to screen for social determinants and make sure a, a patient of a hospital can navigate that's food insecure, but then if they're housing, insecure and all of those things, but each one of those systems are generally closed and causes the nonprofit to decide, do I take the funding or do I work on two different platforms? And I think for foundations, your role would be to give um, and, and, and not to disrupt. And I think the disruption is being done in these data sharing and 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 working off the outcomes that are seen. Okay. So so what I hear you saying in there is we want to maintain the prov provenance of the data. We want the individual nonprofit to be able to show up with their contribution, but maybe foundations have a role in helping set up that structure for sharing. And and they can do some of it in the way they ask for reporting or other things like that. That doesn't blend it in and make it be the foundation's uh, fruit smoothie. Yeah, <laughs> um, but 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 instead they're they're the bowl that the uh, nonprofit fruit salad is in. Um, yeah. I'm going to probably um, beat that metaphor to death over the next six months. So thank you for that, Eric. Um, Mark, same question to you. What do you see in the role of funding agencies in helping us move towards this future that's about data interoperability? Well, you know, Marnie, thanks. I came from an agency. I started as a, well, as a volunteer in a, in a rural Appalachian food pantry. But what I've always seen uh, in this work is that while, it, as Eric said, you know, oftentimes we, uh, the nonprofits get boxed in by, by the funders or the folks that are helping to control many of the levers but what we've seen is by telling a better story uh, and, and having conversations just like this and connecting the data, we can help actually educate the funders, the foundations uh, and, and others about how if we break those, those things that bind us that way, bind us to a particular paradigm or a particular methodology, then the agencies, the nonprofits, the community organizations can band together. One of the practical examples that I've that I've seen work uh, in community is 
when you allow individual agencies, one, as you say, to have their own their own identity uh, and their own place in that in that fruit pole, uh, but they also self-select into working with each other because they can then they're not competing against each other. We started out talking about the whole person. The whole person comes to the food pantry, the clinic, not just the hungry person, not just the person with a uh, diet related disease or another challenge. Um, when we see agencies band together, released by data, um, at a great example of food pantries that I worked with personally here in Ohio, where five food pantries who were all in the Northeast corridor of our community, like all started working together dynamically, not because we as the food bank or the community said, oh, hey, neighborhood services and St. Stephen's Community House and Worthington Community Food Pantry, you should work together. They self-selected and what they figured out by looking at what was their precious data that they would never ever share and by releasing it to each other, they realized, wait a second, we're not serving zip code 43219 we're all right around it. None of us are serving it. Yeah. Well, let's do that. And those are the big wins uh, that I've that I've had the privilege to see in real life. Um, and I think those those can transcend um, can transcend just the charitable food system. While that's been the focus of what we're talking about, food is a part of a larger and broader issue around poverty and systemic racism that extends uh, across all of our country. Yeah, that really resonates with what our colleagues in Columbia were saying yesterday about their experience with data commons and, and the role of civil society organizations because they have territories in the country that are invisible from a government data perspective mm -hmm. because they were on the other side of a civil war and there weren't government services there for 50 years. You, you know, and they, they they instituted the political and paper part of a peace process, but, you know, the, the rest of it, the infrastructure part of a peace and process is still coming. And so they were talking about the exact same thing, that data helps you identify gaps. It helps you bring local context and people into the conversation and that the ability to then step in and fill those places is a tremendous opportunity. Um, and, Emily, I'm going to change the question a little bit for you. And and really say you know you know I understand the company you work for has had some success at going to scale and uh, serving uh, many people around the world in a variety of ways and you know I think I think Google in making Data Commons open source in the investment in using and developing Schema.org you, you know um, has you've set the stage for scale but it still requires investment for that to become a platform. And I, I'm just wondering what you see as the, the investment around that platform that needs to happen. You know, is it is it engineers that are, you know, building radar graph visualizations into it? Is it, it you know, is it people setting up data commons? Is it foundations owning some of that infrastructure? Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Marnie. Uh, we we try. Let's let's start with this before I dive into some some concrete examples. Um, I've worked for a number of companies, and Google is not always right. We are humble enough to recognize that we stumble our way into the future. We try very hard to do the right thing at the right time, uh, and we'll get it wrong sometimes, right? So if Guha were here to say this, uh, he would say to all the food bankers as we did back in June when we had a workshop together, we're probably 90% wrong in how we're doing this. So help us get to 89% wrong, right? Give us feedback along the way and we're going to make a product better. Um, we've done this for many of our platforms. Like if you, if you don't know this, Google Maps actually gets updated every two weeks, for example, right? Because we know that the world changes and we need to be accurate in the representation and it's dynamic. And so, um, I, I love working for this company because of its humility and its willingness to sort of lean in and, and to work across the board, wh whether it's a nonprofit, uh, government, whatnot, to get better um, dynamically over time. 
Um, let me share a concrete example of um, the sort of ethos of, of how Google works with platforms like Data Commons. So I mentioned the Open Handset Alliance way back when. Um, Android would not be what it is today um, if it weren't for millions of developers uh, on the Android uh, operating system. And so, you know, anyone, um, it does, you don't have to be a Googler, you don't have to be a staff member, you can go and build an app and put it on the marketplace and, you know, get users onto your app. Um, we've done a lot of the hard work to sort of build the fundamental infrastructure along with partners um, in, in, in um, you know, other parts of the world um, so that you can go build an app. Whatever your niche is, whatever your expertise is, we want you to be able to get it out there as easy as possible. Um, I see data commons in a similar fashion. Um, you know, when I sort of go back to the roots of this effort about five, six years ago when Guha started this, he also founded schema.org. Um, he wanted to really create a proliferation of sort of citizen scientists, as uh, I believe Mark had mentioned earlier, um, enable, you know, even, at, you know, I have, I have a, a 14 year old a nephew who's starting to ask questions, right? How can we enable him without having him to, uh, you know, have to have like, you know, a, a data science PhD along his side to sort of interrogate public information and, and bring it to his classroom, right? Um, so, you know, as I see the, the platform growing, the investment that we hope to make is to really help any organization, any individual, whatever sector you're in, start to ask questions, right? I encourage you all to go to datacommons.org and ask it a question, right? Just like you might go to google.com and ask it a question, ask it a question. And if it doesn't, you know, serve uh, of what you want, um, tell us, support at datacommons.org. The team behind is incredibly responsive. Uh, we will make it better uh, over time. And that, that's how we've made Google search better, Google Maps better over time is because we get a lot of interesting negative feedback about the platforms and it gets better over time. So uh, that's that's my hope for, for data, datacommons.org. I'm super excited now that it's the sort of foundational platform for the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. I see it um, really sort of, exponentially becoming uh, useful over time because of all of you and because of hopefully millions of people who are looking to use data sets that are already available but not really accessible, um, fully accessible in the world, um, better and faster. That's great. Thank you very much. I um, We're at a minute, so I'm going to say thank you. Uh, to Emily, Mark, and Eric. It's a pleasure not just to have an opportunity to ask you questions in public on this panel, but it's been a pleasure to get to know you through this joint work. And I'm I'm inspired by the, the work you're all doing to help make sure that it, it, in the moment people have the food they need, but also think about the system that needs to be changed so we can get to a better planet. So thanks so much for your work. Thanks so much for the time today. And to all of you participants, thank you very much for being here. Please, we'll be sharing uh, a recording of the session. Um, we'll share the resources that we talked to, but I encourage you to go to datacommons.org and play with it. Um, and, and do tell the engineering team, um, you know, there what works and what doesn't work. Their, their motto is um, negative feedback is actionable. And so um, they take that, that hard feedback and they, they turn it into the next thing. So knowing what doesn't work is as valuable as knowing what does. So thank you very, very much. And uh, we'll see you again soon.